Bonjour à toutes et à tous, ou rebonjour. Good morning again. We're now going to look at how cultural institutions and heritage sites can raise awareness about biodiversity and how they can contribute to preserving it. We have the great pleasure of greeting Sonia Lawson, a director of the Lomé Palace. Thank you very much for being with us, Sonia, from Lomé, Togo. We have Christina Leopold, a commercial director of the Light Art Space in Berlin and member of the board that designed this conference's program. Thank you for coming to us from Berlin. We also have a Parisian there, Misty Monteville, head of uh, RSO missions in the Orsay Museum, and from the Normandy, Marguerite de Mézerac, in charge of tourism development at the Château de Canon. She's also the ambassador for sustainable development in the Audacieux Network. Mathilde Poupé, an advisor at the Académie du Climat, uh, who also joined Dorton, a company dedicated to the ecological transition is going to be moderating this roundtable. Mathilde, you have the floor. Well, that's a good start. Uh, at least uh, I'm giving you a great show. Now that I have your attention, I'm delighted to be here today in such great company, and we're going to be talking about cultural sites and biodiversity. And we're kicking off with Christina. Christina, the uh, light art space in uh, May 2022 inaugurated quite a special garden, which is uh, the uh, brainchild of Alexandra Daisy Greensburg. She called it the pollinator pathmaker. Can you tell us more about it? Definitely. I think you can hear me, right? Yeah. So thank you so much for inviting me here. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me here. I think this is a wonderful opportunity uh, for me to present uh, one of our upcoming projects that was uh, especially um, commissioned um, to be presented in Berlin in summer, spring, summer 2023. And let me see if I can start the slides. So... Uh, Okay, so maybe let's start with this. So this is a very uh, unique and special project for us. Um, I don't know if you are familiar with Light Art Space. We are a non-profit Berlin-based art institution operating at the intersection of art, science, and technology. So this um, project is very much in line um, of what we aim to do and to present. Um, this, what you see here, is a living artwork. It's called Pollinator Pathmaker uh, by British artist Alexandra Daisy Ginsberg. And in a way, it's a response uh, to uh, human-made ecologi ecological damage. Um, you might, may have heard that the decline of pollinator populations um, around the world um, is terrifying. For example, just in Germany, um, Germany has seen a decline of 75% um, of flying insects over the past 25 years. Um, so let me give you a brief introduction of this project. So Pollinator Pathmarker is an artwork especially created for pollinators. Um, pollinators are not just bees. Um, pollinators are also butterflies, moths, wasps, beetles, and uh, many other flying insects. And um, this artwork is planted and cared for by humans. So it's an interspecies project. So the aim of this project is to transform how we see gardens, how we perceive gardens, and to also think about who we make them for. Um, so with this work, the artist um, wants to evoke empathy and to give agency. So there are several elements to the project. Um, what you see here is the algorithm. So there is a digital planting tool. 
Um, it was developed by the artist uh, together with AI. <laughs> yeah, it looks really it looks really pretty there for us, even though it's uh, not meant for human aesthetics. Um, so this algorithm um, was developed by the artist together with AI specialists and uh, pollinator scientists. Um, it's uh, it, it's it's the basis for a so-called digital planting tool um, that creates custom garden planting schemes optimized for pollinators, not human aesthetics. Even though we may think it looks uh, pretty, so an algorithm selects from um, curator curatorial regional plant palettes developed with panels of experts for the various um, biogeographic regions. So um, the first project, the artist comes from the UK and the first uh, garden project was implemented um, in Cornwall at Eden projects. Um, so this is the Atlantic bio biogeographic region, which is very different from Berlin, um, uh, the continental biogeographic region. So this is even more important but I think we'll be speaking about why we need yeah why why, why we need like experts um, along the project supporting us and advising us um, so what you see here is actually the planting process of the garden at Eden projects in Cornwall um, so this is the second aspect of the project. It's the so-called edition gardens. And LIS will present the second edition garden um, in Berlin in summer. So these are large-scale commissioned works. Um, and um, yeah, so this is September 2021. And um, every new international edition garden involves curating a new regional plant palette with local experts. So we are closely working with the Museum of Natural History uh, in Berlin. So next part, uh, what you see here is a website you can all already access. It exists in English and in German language uh, to date, um, pollinator.art. Um, so everyone can access this website and audiences can use um, the same algorithm the artist is using for free to create their own unique plantable artworks, so mini gardens basically, uh, which um, um, so to benefit local pollinators. So the idea is really that there is not one edition, large scale edition garden in Berlin, but we really hope that lots of communities and also private people. Uh, engage in this project by using the website, creating their own gardens specifically or optimized for pollinators. And so I stole this image. I'm not allowed if I'm, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to show it yet. So this is obviously just a sketch up. What you see here is the Museum of Natural History. They have a large uh, lawn uh, in front, so the Museum of Natural History is A, our partner, and B, the best visited museum in Berlin. Um, and um, I think it's a, a perfect location to plant uh, the garden. Um, um, we started already, we work with various um, stakeholders in this proje project, experts, um, scientists, um, curators and of course the artist and her team. Um, we already started sketching out planting schemes, um, designs and uh, will start planting uh, very very soon. Um, and let me see. Okay, I think you can uh, look at our website lightartspace.org to find more information on the artist on the project and I would uh, like to warmly invite you if you have a chance to come to Berlin to get in touch and uh, visit our project. 
Merci beaucoup, Christina. On reviendra un peu plus tard. Well, thank you so much, uh, Christina. So we'll uh, come back to these ideas of, you know, doing it yourself, you know, creating your own pollinator-friendly garden. Uh, that's uh, for a specific regions, a given region. So how does the planting work? In fact, is it the artist doing it or is the work delegated? Exactly. It's a very close collaboration. Um, of course, the artist is, with the help of the algorithm, designing uh, the planting schemes um, and an, an ideal living environment for pollinators. Um, it's been supervised by the scientists in Germany from the Museum of Natural History and we are working with the Royal Garden Academy um, in Berlin who, uh, who will provide uh, the plants and will make sure that the garden is being planted um, according to the designs and hopefully will um, grow into a, a beautiful living artwork. Merci beaucoup. Um, okay, thank you. So, the light art space is known for mixing science, technology, and art. So, technology is this uh, can also destroy biodiversity. So, I'm wondering about this. So, do you think that technology can be a tool to preserve biodiversity? In this case, I want to say yes. Um, I think technology uh, is a wonderful tool. Um, it's it's also a call to, you know, the art, helping to create this kind of artwork, which you know, and evokes empathy, helps to change perspective, um, and and allows for agency. Um, I think it's 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 a, a, a it's a great tool. Um, that can be used, which is accessible. It's not just out there. There's the website and uh, the digital tool that can be used. Um, I meant to say something else, but I just forgot. Oh, yeah, I think it's important to mention that this hopefully will become the world's largest climate positive project. So uh, it will be monitored, it will be measured uh, in the UK as well as in Berlin. Uh, the more DIY gardens uh, that will appear will basically enhance and support the, the pollinator um, environment, you know, S since there, th there will be pathways. So I'm probably the wrong person to explain this in detail, but pollinators, if they have, if there are many gardens, there will be pathways so they can fly from garden to garden. So this would be what we really hope for. All right, uh, thank you. And so, as Christina has said, we need these types of uh, positive uh, projects uh, that uh, can uh, get everyone contributing to biodiversity. Uh, so it's uh, great to see such a lively, colorful, beautiful project. Now let's talk about another one, the Orsay Museum. And we've got Misty. Monteville, who's going to talk to us about this. This is a, a, a very new and unusual uh, project. Tell us about it. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to speak. So we are hoping that uh, this project will also be positive. Let me talk a bit about its origins. Uh, so. I work at both uh, the Orsay Museum and the Orangerie Museum that are in fact uh, a single establishment. Uh, and the, the question we've been asking ourselves is that as a museum of the fine arts, how can we position ourselves uh, with society, to evolve with society? And so two years ago, we developed an uh, a strategy, organizational social responsibility strategy, so a bit like CSR, but for organizations such as ours, so taking into account social and environmental concerns in all of our projects. Uh, 
And so the idea is that it must become automatic in everything that we do, that it must be part of our mission as exhibits are our mission, uh, as is our research on Impressionist works of the 19th century. And so we've uh, got a specific policy for the uh, social responsibility, but we also have an environmental responsibility uh, strategy as well to reduce our consumption, first of all, our emissions, uh, uh, working in a circular economy. And so then we came to the question of biodiversity. So the Ossé Museum and the Orangerie Museum you know, we are in the heart of Paris, uh, in uh, surrounded, uh, you know, with uh, stone buildings, asphalt surfaces. It's all uh, stone, asphalt. There's a uh, very little green spaces. And now, it's true that we are at the uh, Tuileries Gardens, but that belong to the Louvre Museum. It doesn't belong to the Orangerie. So for us, what can we do? In fact, to uh, take on board the question of biodiversity. And I'm really happy to participate in this talk here today because, you know, we talk a lot about reducing our carbon emissions, but uh, biodiversity we tend to forget about. But they, but I think they really both go together. Uh, so uh, I really want to congratulate you on uh, choosing this uh, topic. But uh, so for a museum, what can we do? Well, for us at Orsay and Orangerie, we had an idea to say that, well, in our collections at the Orsay Museum, we have the largest Impressionist collection in the world and many Impressionist painters who had done paintings around the town of Argenteuil, northwest of Paris, a small town. And at the end of the 19th century, uh, 1870, a lot of Impressionists that went there. Uh, Claude Monet, for example, lived there for several years in two different homes, and he invited all of his painter friends to come. So there are many paintings uh, by Monet in particular representing Argenté. I think it's about 180 paintings. So it's, it's about one painting every 12 days. So he was very prolific. Then we have Sisley, Caibot. So many representations of this small town. And so we were starting to think about a partnership uh, working on the notion of uh, 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 more uh, openness of our collection. And so what we end with a an environmental pillar as well. So, so just a few months ago, in May, in fact, we began working with the town of Argenté that wanted to do some uh, work uh, to uh, renovate the embankments of the river, which currently have been somewhat neglected. So they would like to restore them. So the idea for us was to work with them, uh, including through financial support, but in particular, the idea behind the project was to have our collection uh, managers to work with the town uh, to rethink the re to, to think about the redevelopment of these embankments uh, to match what had been done by the Impressionist painters. Uh, so there's, first of all, there's also the environmental action here. There's carbon uh, uh, capturing uh, that is uh, done with more. But of course, uh, we're talking, OK, let's be modest here. We're not talking about a huge space, but every little bit counts. And there's also uh, the notion of protecting biodiversity. So what can we do to preserve the local nature? And there's a Japanese invasive species uh, that's going to have to be removed so that the local species can return. Uh, so we've been working with the town of Argenté uh, on uh, this. And uh, we've got other projects 
underway with the town, but that's in just a few words, uh, the work that we're doing. Well, that's really fascinating. You know, when we talk about biodiversity, you know, we talk about loss of biodiversity and extinction, but uh, if you uh, if you n now com compare, you know, the way the town is now and the way it was at the time of the Impressionists, uh, well, that's a very interesting idea. But is it uh, uh, something, do you think, that is achievable? And do you think there really was uh, a lot more biodiversity at the time? What are you going to do? What are you, how are you approaching this? the side. Okay, well, in, in fact, when you, I've sh you've got a few pictures here, but in fact, what you can see here is that some of the landscapes had very few uh, trees uh, because it uh, there uh, these were cargo hauling paths alongside and we thought well you know we wanted to plant more trees but that's not the way it was actually in the paintings because uh, those are real uh, working lanes along the uh, uh, so the idea is not to reproduce them identically, but uh, to take inspiration of the look and feel of the place at the time. Uh, so, but uh, we really do want to focus on biodiversity and carbon sequestration. Uh, could you also say a few words about carbon sequestering and carbon offsetting? Uh, now, uh, it's a, isn't it wonderful to be able to d d today ask such a question of a museum? Uh, it's not something no one would have done 10 years ago. Well, for us, it's a, a question that uh, we have been working on. Yes, uh, people talk a lot about offsetting, carbon offsetting. So if you emit a certain quantity of uh, emissions, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, I mean, for, 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 and you heard a lot about that the previous roundtable. So if you're emitting a certain quantity on the other side, you're trying to offset it by doing something positive, like capturing it on the other side. And so typically what one does is to plant trees. But the notion of offsetting is now being criticized because it's seen as something of a, a license to uh, generate emissions, in fact. Uh, and so for us, uh, the idea of carbon capture or sequestering is uh, but for, for us, it's more about avoidance than reduction, and then only what we can't avoid or reduce, then you offset. But that's the last option, okay? Also, so between offsetting and sequestering, the idea is to say, well, the trees that are going to be planted, all of the planting that will be done, this is not going to offset, you know, our emissions. We know that. Uh, so it's uh, not about, so it's not greenwashing. We're not lying about, you know, the scope of the impact here. Okay. Well, okay. Thank you. Uh, and if you have questions later, we will have time for questions and answers uh, at the end of the talk. So now, let's now move on to Sonia's talk about uh, the Lomé Palace. Uh, we are delighted to have you here with us, and I'm sure our audience is uh, thrilled to learn about it. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really happy to be here to talk about Lomé Palace in Togo. So it, okay, 
Est-ce que vous m'entendez mieux uh, OK. Thank you. So the palace faces the Atlantic, and you can see we're surrounded by greenery. And the place has always been surrounded by greenery. Let's, uh, so this was the former governor's uh, palace uh, that, well, went through, saw a lot of uh, disruptive uh, history between the uh, German and British and uh, French occupation. And uh, it had been abandoned for a long time as well. So I was lucky to be part of the team in charge of the renovation. So here, well, tropical nature is quite powerful. So imagine an abandoned site, so something abandoned for over 20 years. Well, well, biodiversity wasn't the question here. I mean, it, it was already there. And uh, so here you can see what uh, uh, nature uh, taking over. So the, uh, we were having to take this into uh, consideration when we wanted to re renovate the site, uh, but uh, preserving the biodiversity that had come and uh, taken over. And so I, I know that in France there's a lot of discussion going on. In 2014, I was discussing with other museum professionals at the time who were saying, well, you know, talking, and they said, uh, well, biodiversity is not a topic for us. You know, the, uh, the, that's not part of our mission. Uh, that's not part of a museum's job. It's just uh, beyond their scope. OK, it's nice to talk about it. There's no connection. That's what uh, French museum professionals were uh, telling me. But things have changed a great deal in just a few years. And now biodiversity is a very much part of the thinking and action of museums. So that's good news. So as you can see, we have a park in the city, it's in, so it's an urban park, and it is the only large park of the city. Uh, but in many uh, capital cities on the coast uh, of Africa, well, they've uh, suffered from urban sprawl. They've been, so it's uh, one of the rare spots uh, that is uh, still open to the public and and, and uh, still preserved, uh, though all the uh, shorelines have a huge real estate value. So the idea is to preserve this city park, uh, very much inspired by Togolese culture. And so it's a walk through uh, the uh, landscapes of Togo and the culture of Logo. And uh, so it, uh, so we went around to get inspiration from villages uh, and other places in the country, and uh, we brought back uh, plants and seeds. Uh, so you see, we've got the savanna. We've got uh, the northern end of it has cactuses representing the more arid north, and then. And then we have another area representing Palime. So it's the idea is to really reflect the different landscapes of our country here in this park. And so the uh, trail through the park uh, has a little surprises here and there, the park. And so, so it's a not an English or a, a French style a garden. We wanted to have a Togo style uh, garden. Um, so uh, the approach was quite different. And biodiversity for us is very much part of our uh, culture. And often these plants have other meanings. They are ritual uses, uh, medicinal uses. Uh, so this is harking back to some traditional practices that are uh, disappearing in some cases. Uh, so there was a lot of educational programs that were developed as well. Every week about a 1,000. Uh, school children come, uh, and so particularly for uh, local youth, it's very interesting because they've grown up in a very dense urban city, and uh, now they have access once again to uh, the park of the palace. Uh, and the artworks are also 
uh, ways to encourage thinking around uh, our natural environment. So look at this uh, work of art here, made uh, from recovered materials. Uh, and so it's the I so here we have talks with the children about reusage, uh, recycling and reusage. Uh, uh, and of course, uh, we can also talk about nature's here, the water lilies in this uh, pond. Uh, and the children loved it, you know. And when I, we told the children uh, that a French artist uh, devoted years of his life to painting water lilies, well, uh, that uh, the children found that very funny. And so for us, art is a good way to engage the discussion with children. So what is the common point, for example, in these traditionally dressed voodoo uh, women, a uh, turtle from Florida, and an artwork in the middle? What's the common point? Well, the art it's the artist, because the artwork in the middle represents a turtle, uh, the artist as uh, Serge. Anumu uh, took inspiration uh, from uh, the shell necklaces worn uh, uh, by the voodoo ladies. Uh, and he used retrieved bits of fabric and plastic, and he makes them into artworks and uh, with a particular focus on the fragility of a sea life. And so this is a great opportunity discussing with uh, different types of uh, school visitors, but also adult visitors to uh, talk about how fragile our ecosystem is. And so, and we can also talk to school children about the traditional voodoo practices of the country. And that turtle, we had found it just off the coast, I mean, just off the shore, and it had a, a ring, it came from Florida. In fact, uh, we discovered and it, it had uh, swum across the Atlantic. Uh, and so, uh, but in fact, it's a, a species that is uh, nearing extinction. Uh, so it's a good opportunity to talk with uh, children about geography, about, ex about extinction. Uh, uh, and so an artwork uh, can be inspiring in many ways. You can talk about a lot of things. And of course, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the children are interested in the idea of making art with any kind of material as well. And so what's also important is the involvement of our museum staff. Uh, so here we've got our stone village created by our gardeners. Uh, OK, they're not landscapers. Uh, they're ordinary gardeners. Uh, but who created this little village uh, inspired by villages in the north of Togo. So I think it's also very interesting to involve all uh, people working on the site to contribute to, to uh, projects. Uh, and this whole idea of enhancing the biodiversity here, uh, well, during the renovation works, uh, and I was uh, talking with the uh, bricklayers, the uh, uh, he was very familiar with traditional uh, medicines. Uh, and so a lot of the uh, plants that we often think of as weeds, he said, well, no, this plant has these medicinal virtues. You have to pick it early in the morning, etc." And we realized that the, this person had this traditional knowledge that we had, uh, you know, uh, well, I have a question for you, Sonia. Uh, the, so these ancestral knowledge, uh, they are re-emerging. I get uh, the impression uh, and particularly, you know, knowledge about uh, uh, plants. In France, we're starting to see more usage of essential oils and other plants. and and. Uh, Using new, uh, using traditional fibers uh, such as hemp and linen rather than polyester. D do you think that there that there is a return to the uh, 
traditional know-how? And uh, is your institution also doing something to encourage people uh, in this return to traditional practices? Well, yes, we do. And we have ethnobotanists who uh, uh, who tell us that there is a renewed interest. And we also work with experts, uh, botanists from the University of uh, Lomé as well. And uh, so, but it's important uh, to reestablish the dialogue with our elders. Uh, and, you know, and, when, uh, the, and the idea is uh, to reach out to our teenagers as well. And, you know, we tell them, well, you know, Coca-Cola, well, the uh, uh, nut and fruit is, comes from this uh, uh, nuts and uh, f from uh, that were originally. Uh, originated from our country, you know, so little bits of information like that, uh, you can get uh, teenagers interested. And then there are our local artisans, uh, textile artisans. So at our museum shop, we sell scarves inspired by the colors of one of our bird species. Here you see the shukador. Uh, so is, uh, the colors of the bird uh, inspire these weavers. And so we say, so this uh, fabric that you're buying, the, the colors, uh, all of this was done by local artisans and imitating the colors of this, uh, of this bird. Uh, and so it's also a source of dialogue. You said there were 41 species of birds in the park. Any other? species that live in the park or, or a tree, be it a plant or animal species. Yes, we have um, many different uh, species, including plant species. We left some parts of the park a bit wild to see what would grow best there. And then there's, of course, the baobab. They're quite young still. But, uh, you know, normally visitors are used to seeing these huge, very grandiose baobabs, but here are the young ones that have started, so people are interested to see what they look like when they're much smaller. And, uh, and then we can, you know, we can talk about a lot of plant species, including the threatened ones. And there are wild fruits as well that many people simply weren't aware of, particularly those living in uh, the city. And it's also the opportunity to uh, discuss uh, nutrition, uh, the edible plants. And uh, it's uh, true that our cuisine is uh, the traditional cuisine made use of all of these uh, plants. Unfortunately, since, co well, since COVID, of course, we're also thinking more about, uh, you know, uh, immune, um, the immune system and which are the plants uh, that uh, can help uh, improve our immune system. So the idea here is to talk to people differently about uh, nature. We have our performances. Here we have musicians. Uh, uh, and so that's uh, just to give you a few ideas of some of the activities that we run. Thank you so much, Sonia. I think we've uh, now heard how the palace uh, tries to really be in a strong and close relationship with its biodiversity. Excellent. And now we're moving on to a completely different place. And uh, I would like to give the floor to Marguerite. It, this is, again, a cultural institution. When you're going to tell us about those heritage gardens. Yes, thank you. I'm delighted to be here today for this roundtable on biodiversity. So I uh, would like to show you this picture of the Chateau de Canon, the Canon Castle in Normandy. It's a family estate that dates back to the 18th century. There's a lot of buildings and about one hectare of uh, buildings and 15 hectares of gardens. So obviously, this can be a haven for many different species, both fauna and flora. We are a historic monument. We are distinguished as a remarkable garden. But this is just one example of a palace in France uh, that has this kind of setup. 
because there are more than 2,600 uh, castles in the Association of Remarkable Gardens. So when you get into this group, you also commit to protecting biodiversity on your site, which I think is absolutely uh, wonderful. And I think it's great that we're discussing it in the private sector of cultural institutions. I'm not going to tell you about the whole story uh, of uh, this uh, place, uh, but uh, one thing that is remarkable is that we have a lot of water, a lot of uh, water springs. We have uh, French style gardens and uh, British style gardens. And this kind of English gardens, they really leave room for spontaneous growth and spontaneous uh, 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 areas. We don't have everything in the French style that's always so uh, clear cut with uh, straight lines and everything. We have uh, some trees that are more than 300 years old. But this is really a reservoir for biodiversity and for nature. We also have flower gardens. So we are really a green lung in the local area. Even though we're not in such a big city uh, as Lomé, we do have urban settlements all around the castle. If you could see a bigger picture, you would see that. So I have a few pictures of, oh, I think I took the wrong pictures. No, there it is. Ooh, that's a relief. But, well, we can still see a number of things that are interesting. Yes, but this is what I wanted to show you, actually, the park itself. Uh, this was in the 1950s, where uh, it was uh, really tumbled down. And back then, you could not visit the park. It was not maintained in the same way, so there has been a number of things that have been destroyed. And that's the vegetation back then, really growing everywhere. And we also had a lot of fauna. I think I did say that it was family owned. And I've been working for my family in law for 14 years, but my husband, that's his family, grew up seeing a lot of different animals, uh, foxes and hedgehogs everywhere in the family's garden. And now the family is working on the restoration of this park to you know, bring it up to another level. And like I said, there has been a lot of urban development around the castle. And one of the questions that we asked ourselves was, how do we get the animals back? How do we get those species, this, this fauna back into the park? Because there used to be a lot more biodiversity. So for the last four years, we started partnerships with uh, associations because we ourselves are not specialists of biodiversity, but there are a lot uh, of not-for-profit associations that do that in a great way. There's a, uh, an authentic ornithological association in Normandy, for example, that helped us. We uh, have 15 hectares to maintain. It's not that big, but it's already uh, a lot of space. And what we decided to do was to set apart part of this park that is not maintained. So we leave it wild and free, and then we can go back every year and see what happens there. And uh, there, this kind of actions has already been carried out in other places, and they have seen some species coming back to the parks. Yes, I'd like to stop on that thing, actually. Uh, whether for Lomé or for uh, Canon, there has been a change in mindset because those are cultural establishments that are really focused on the aesthetics of the gardens. And now you decided to set aside some parts of the gardens where the human hand does not intervene at all. So instead, you're focusing on the well-being of other species of pollinizing insects. And uh, that's really innovating to have that. So I would like to congratulate you on this initiative. Yes, um, we're hoping that this is actually going to give ideas to other estates. Uh, 
Uh, there are some uh, other sites, for example, in, in one of them, uh, there are toads. And uh, you know that they can be very noisy. And uh, still, they, even though they have uh, visitors and even overnight visitors, they decided to still do it. So we explain that to our visitors, and they understand and actually like it in many cases. We also discovered something else. Uh, the park itself, of course, will be home to many different species, but not just the park, the buildings as well. And that's something that we had completely underestimated. And that's why I mentioned that we have a lot of buildings. And we inventoried the bats that we have with the Mammalogy Group of Normandy. And we discovered that we had six different species of bats. So we have whole colonies in our buildings. And we did not even know that. And this is the reception area. And there's a colony of 100 great bats over there. Uh, just over that room, and we did not know that. We now have signed for a partnership with the Mammalogical Association, and they come and survey the colony every year. But they also maintain it because uh, one of the reasons why people don't want bats in uh, their buildings is because uh, of their droppings. Uh, they can actually uh, do quite a lot of damage to your building uh, because of that. But thanks to this association, they come and maintain it. And uh, then we keep the droppings and we use it as a fertilizer. So with this association, we have this possibility of surveying and having an inventory. Uh, we also have an inventory of owls. We keep windows open so that they can come and nest. And now we are trying to um, showcase that to our audience. Of course, we're not going to have uh, visitors climbing up into the rafters to go and gape at the bats. But instead, we do feel that we have a responsibility to help them uh, discover those species. And we have a responsibility protecting them and raising awareness. So there's a, a lot of uh, thought that has been uh, done on that process, because we want to, to protect that uh, uh, fauna that is very shy of visitors. Thank you, Marguerite. And we are nearing the end of our panel. I still have 1,000 questions to ask, but I'm sure that there are some questions in the audience as well. So um, one thing that I will say, however, is that I really liked how this panel framed how cultural establishments can work on biodiversity. Sometimes it's about recreating dedicated spaces where biodiversity can flourish, gardens or riverbanks. Or it can be about opening up your buildings to host some of those species. So I'm absolutely delighted by everything I heard. Now let's turn to the audience. You can speak in French or English, and we will be translating into the other language. Thank you. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for uh, these, uh, these presentations. So something that we've heard a number of times is that those are relatively recent practices. Do you already have support for this kind of initiatives? There's a lot of talk on climate change and uh, greenhouse gases, etc. But if we save the climate, but we've already killed all the species, that's not going to be a lot of help. So what do we do uh, there? Do you have support? Subsidies? Are there informal networks to share the information in the best practices? Maybe in the cultural space, but maybe not just there. OK. Uh, who would like to take that? Uh, it's true that we are only in the first stages of this process. And in our case, uh, we have two worlds that used to be quite separate. 
So now we're really working on sharing information uh, between different groups. For example, the mammalogy group uh, would really love to have better access to the castles. But sometimes the owners are quite reluctant to having those groups come over and survey their bat colonies. So I think that even having the sharing of information and uh, um, making sure that we disseminate information about those partnerships, that's already very useful. I'm thinking of that question in contemporary art. Uh, do you think that it's easier? Do you think that you get more support or not at all? Um. I mean, as a contemporary art institution, we have a certain mission. So we make art, or we, we aim to make art accessible to everyone. And the kind of art, especially at the intersection of art, art science and technology, um, does involve, and that's what you can see in the past projects we've been, uh, we presented, commissioned and presented, uh, re relevant for today's society, relevant topics, and that's climate change, that's uh, biodiversity, and um, this is this is also. I mean, we commission artworks to so the artists. We it's it's a co-development in many ways, and um, the the topics of these artworks um, come directly from the artist. That there is like I feel. There is a strong, um, a strong wish to create awareness, um, and uh, in especially the field of you know climate uh, and biodiversity, and that's in a way it's, it comes natural, I want to say. And of course, if you then look left and right, I mean, you find collaborators. And for us in Berlin, the Museum of Natural History is a very, very natural and uh, the best collaborator we can think of. So, you know, these topics bring institutions, various institutions together who might not have come together maybe before. I would like to add just one thing here on this a specific question of how cultural institutions can work together. Uh, I'm not advertising the next session, but, uh, well, I am actually. We'll have a round table at uh, half past two about networking in this space and how we can collaborate between institutions to work on this transition. Can we have one more question? Do we have one? All right, and I think I would like to conclude on one more question, but please uh, try to be concise when answering it. Uh, bridging culture and the ecology, that's quite recent. Was it difficult to motivate your teams to work on that uh, and to take that into their own hands? I'd like to hear the four of you, but please uh, keep it brief because we don't have a lot of time left. Okay, I'll start then. Uh, I came in 2020 to my institution, right before the COVID crisis. And back then, uh, there was the beginning of an awareness, uh, but it was not a topic that was often discussed. And after COVID, there was a lot more discussion of that. Uh, 2022 was the time of the energy crisis. There was a lot of questions about uh, funding as well. Uh, so there's been a lot of change. Uh, over the years, yes. I would say that from the get-go, from the very beginning of the design of the project, uh, there has been some awareness. But when we recruited the team, we took that into account. So that has been part of our discussions with gardeners, with cultural staff, uh, with local partners. It was there from the very beginning, yes. Yes, that's a definite yes. The, uh, uh, yes, it was difficult, I mean. The gardeners had been around for 30 years, but the land had been left fallow, and they had to redo everything, and they were quite scared that they would be swamped again with too much work. And it's true that there's a lot of work to do in educating uh, the different people. So our head gardener, uh, for example, thinks uh, of 
some species as uh, being problematic and of course if you do not maintain your garden well there is this idea that it means that you have a personal issue with morality you know this is a kind of a 19th century thinking that if you don't maintain and groom your garden well then it says something about your personality and that you're a slob basically so people would be panicking about leaving weeds to grow for example so it was kind of difficult to change this mindset and uh, we still have uh, some work to do yes uh, so we are a pretty young institution with our uh, first exhibition uh, end of 2019, but sustainability has been, um, I want to say, an integral part uh, of what we do from the very beginning. Um, we do have KPIs. Uh, we do have a sustainability KPI um, just to make sure that the whole team runs into the same direction and that we look at you know from uh, at at curation uh, production communication and anything administrative always from a, a sustainability social but also ecological sustainability point of view so that's how we make sure and no the team is super excited and usually has so many ideas that we are not even able to implement all of them <laughs> Uh, thank you very much to the four of you. To preserve biodiversity, there might be a secret ingredient, which is to leave it alone, actually, and to leave it some space. And I'm very optimistic when I see what your four institutions do, because this is what you're doing, uh, and uh, that's absolutely great. Thank you, everyone, for your attention. Thank you to the five of you. Indeed, we can be optimistic.